Uh, gonna, yeah. Tonight, uh, tonight will be a number of surprises. Uh, that's for sure. <laughs> so, I'll tell you one thing: I'm waiting for my laptop to show me that we're officially live, and uh, there we are. Indeed, we are live. And hi, everybody. Good to be here. Good to uh, see you all. Welcome to 2023, our first tomorrow episode for. 2023 very very excited uh to be here with you all because here we are it's great uh i'm jared this is ryan over here as i bump into everything uh possible this is going to be a really fun show because we have got just so much uh so much to talk about um it's just oh it's just full of everything um and you know kicking off the new year with all of that you know and uh it's uh tonight it's just me and ryan uh again uh folks are uh our other folks jamie uh and dada mom and dad uh if you will uh they're out and they're busy uh right now so yeah so again i uh, just gonna you know saying hi to everybody with everything there and uh 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 asher yyz saying hey happy new year to everybody so very very uh awesome uh with that so yeah somebody just told me that my mic is the wrong way so sorry about that uh you should see what it's like in here right now because i am driving <laughs> flying, uh because uh the monitors have been moved and other things and it's probably i probably turned my mic the uh, opposite way as well which is definitely um I'm sure someone will correct me at some point, which is always good. Uh, but yeah, the monitors that I would usually be looking at right now, not only are they not pointed at me, which is no big deal. I actually can't, um, can't see it. Um, <laughs> I like that for a second. I thought Jared shirt said I am from France. Um, <laughs> no, not quite. If you need to see what it says, uh, I can, I think I can scoot over here. Oh, that's the wrong way. So maybe I'll come back over here. Um, remember, I'm having to look down here at my laptop to figure this out. There you go. There you so, go. Uh, those of you, some of you, uh, some of you will recognize that I'm sure at some point. So, uh, yeah. But uh, thank you to my to my San Francisco partner Tracy uh, for that. Thank you so much. Uh, and and uh, their wife Kenny, appreciate it. Uh, th this was a Christmas late Christmas gift, but it's it's awesome. Um, so. As Raul uh, is alluding to uh, space goblins, uh, yeah, there's there's uh, there's some stuff that's kind of been happening uh, of late, and it's not really been great. Uh, we talked about last year uh, ending the year with Vegas e on its inaugural launch, uh, losing it and having an anomaly and losing its payload on board. Uh, so. Yeah, not good uh, for that there. Um, and it, it continues into 2023, it seems, doesn't it, Ryan? A successful start to the new year uh, that we all would have wanted has not materialized. Sadly, we've had two no, not at launch all. failures. <laughs> oh, yeah. Two launch failures. Um uh, Robert said that it's because we haven't been live uh, f uh, and two rockets fail. Maybe it's all our fault. Well, I was live for one of them. Uh, so uh, myth has been debunked. So that is not the reason why the rockets kept failing. Yeah. Do you have your footage um, of that? Uh, it sh it's on the channel somewhere if you look for it. Okay. I'll, like, I'll jump on there yeah. real quick. Okay. And then, yeah. I mean, make this look like we're, we know what we're doing. We do. Half of the so, time. So... <laughs> so Monday, start me up, launched from Cornwall, and um, everything went fine until the second stage decided it no longer wanted to work, and then it stopped working. And then Tuesday, ABL launched their RS1 for the first time. We're like, yeah, finally it happens. They don't provide a live stream or anything. Oh, look at that. It actually looks like we know what we're doing. ABL don't <laughs> provide a live stream or anything like that. So we were just getting tweets, and they said that it said the next tweet, they said they were, they tweeted a launch time, and they said in the tweet that their next tweet would be once they're flying and whatnot. So we got the next tweet, and the rocket had failed, and it had fallen back to the launch pad. And from what we've been told, it's gone a bit kaboom on the pad, so the pad will need repairs. There are some images going around, but I don't think there's anything official from ABL yet. I don't know if that's 
I've, I, I'll be, I have to be honest, I haven't really been looking today. Yeah, there was, there, I did not find anything official either. Brian, was it windy out there? Was it windy out there? I mean, I, mean, I wasn't there, were, so I don't know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it, it definitely got a lot better into the evening. I arrived around half past 12, one o'clock. It was windy, windy, windy. It certainly calmed down as we got towards 10 o'clock and the takeoff of Cosmic Girl, but it was still windy. And in the morning, it was uh, Jonathan Amos from the BBC did a tweet. Uh, that was, I think it was about 7, 8 o'clock in the morning, and they were getting gusts of 75 kilometers an hour there. Uh, yeah, so luckily the wind calms down quite a lot for our sake, the media on a bit on, on scaffolding looking over the airfield, yeah. and for the sake of Cosmic Girl and Launcher One, because a, a strong co- crosswind is not what you want. Less than ideal, I would feel, uh, if you're carrying a whole load of liquid oxygen. So, um, yeah, I'm no expert, but that doesn't sound like a uh, a, f- uh, a too safe thing to have happen. Uh, but yeah, there it goes. Wow, look at that. That's Ow. beautiful. It, it is. It was. Yeah. And is. Well, and I did goes. tweet it. If you can pull up my tweet real quick. Cosmic Girl has left New Key today. Uh, arrived in... Might still be flying. I'm not sure. Uh, Cosmic Girl arrived in Fort Lauderdale earlier today. Uh, it may still be in Fort Lauderdale. Or it may be on its way to back to Mojave. I don't know. You might have to... Yeah, I'm run, I'm running here right now, so yeah. Uh, so to, I'm gonna, to gonna I'm gonna up. have a look quickly to see where Cosmic Girl actually is. Obviously, we can't sure. show you because we'll get banned from Twitter. Yeah, where Cosmic Girl is right now. Yeah, you're uh, gonna send out the assassination coordinates um, <laughs> for it there. So um, hold on just a second. I'm gonna be pulling this up. As you can see, we're doing this very professionally uh, today. But that was uh, there we go. Look at that. Yeah, that was over Washington D.C. Uh, with it there. So yep. very very cool. So. And Cosmic Girl uh, landed in Fort Lauderdale at one uh, uh, twenty-four local time in the afternoon today, and it's still there, according to Flight Radar Twenty-Four. Oh, okay, so it's still hanging out. Maybe it's just like a crew or uh, like a crew rest going on at Fort Lauderdale yeah. or something like that. Yeah, Jason's saying that it'll look like uh, they would do that. Um, JTTV is saying that. It looked a bit cold. Do you think that O-rings would be an issue? And um, I would say, in my limited understanding of Launcher One, probably not, because I can't imagine it. Can't I mean I can imagine that it was cold on the ground, but up at altitude where it's dropped from, I would imagine it's even colder up there, and it's exposed for that for a very long period of time. Yeah, and Launcher One, if you didn't know, it's absolutely covered in insulation. It's a very, I'd like to call it a very fluffy rocket. It's actually just foam, but it looks kind of fluffy. You can see in the uh, in the close-up shots that Virgin Orbit released when uh, Launcher One first touched down in the back of a C-17 with a certain Dutter that it is absolutely covered in foam. Mm-hmm. You can see the, all the little shadows. You can, it, yeah. The, the model that the UK Space Agency built and put in the public area is, is lovely and smooth. And that's not how it is at all. It's absolutely covered in foam and it's very good at insulation. And Jared's just ran off because he realised he left the light on. Good. So I'm having to keep talking and Jared's <laughs> back. <laughs> yeah, it's really uh, it's a really entertaining time uh, here at two zero four. I'll tell you that. Um, oh, uh, Jason is asking you uh, how long of a trip was it for you, Ryan? And I guess Ryan, just in general, what was it like covering uh, this this first attempt at a launch? What was it like? Um, so the drive on the way down was all right because we split it over two days. So we did. Three, like three and a half hours on, on Sunday afternoon, evening. And then we stayed over halfway near uh, MOD Boscombe Down, which is the, uh, not the abort site, but like the backup landing site for Cosmic Girl. And then we, then we did the remaining three and a half hour drive on Monday morning, arrived at Newquay Airport for about half 12, and then stood outside for about 12 hours on some scaffolding in the, in the, <laughs> It, I'm going to say freezing cold. It was like 10 degrees outside, but the winds did not make it feel like 10 degrees. It, so I'm going to say in the freezing cold, absolutely dying, um, I got a hat. That's good. You always want a hat. 
That's that's for sure. Was did you? Oh, was it just a hat you brought, or was it a hat that you got, that they gave you? Oh, eighteen great British pounds. Look at that! Wow, that is official, officially yeah. official. So that and looks. A, and a, I got a lanyard for free though. It's a fantastic look for you there, Ryan. Yeah, bring bring the lanyard out as well. With that, so, so th this is how I looked on launch day, right? This is hopefully a bit so more stylish, right? Hopefully a bit more bundled up than that. So. Yeah, micro micro night says eighteen quid. Yes, eighteen quid. Yeah, eighteen. I I don't know how much that is in American dollars, in freedom dollars. No clue. Haven't a clue. Like twenty two dollars, something like that. Oh, okay, know. that's relatively reasonable for a hat, I guess. I don't, I don't know. So it sounds about right for me. So interesting um with it so three stone thanks arvale i appreciate it um yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh terrence shepherd asking a really good question here which is uh does Co did cosmic girl land in the uk after launch or just continue to florida no they landed back at uh yeah they came Cornwall. straight back to the uk yeah yeah and was... they stayed there for a couple of days and they just left earlier today they left this morning about uh like uh, eight nine o'clock in the, this morning and they headed transatlantic back to fort lauderdale which is where cosmic girl stopped off on the leg to the uk yeah uh and uh john j benstead is asking is virgin galactic or uh, virgin uh, orbit uh going to try again in the uk and i would uh i would imagine that they probably are yeah so virgin orbit and spaceport cornwall have an agreement i think it's for 10 years i it's some it's something along those lines around around 10 years um in the press conference before the launch, uh, Dan Hart, the CEO of Virgin Orbit, said that he wanted to be back in Cornwall before the end of the year. Obviously now, the launcher one failed to get to orbit, so there's going to have to be an investigation that has already started and is currently ongoing. Once they get the results of that, they'll have to implement whatever fixes they need to implement, then that will have a knock-on effect to the net, to the backlog of launches that already exists because they were waiting for the regulatory, regulatory approval from Cornwall. They then, then need to get that back, backlog, which is probably going to get longer with this investigation, out of Mojave before they can then come back to Cornwall and get the next UK launch done. And I'm going to have a guess if he was aiming for the end of the year before the failure, I'm going to guess definitely not until 2024 at this point, which is disappointing, but they have to get their backlog of orders out of the way before they can then look to the future. Yeah, and uh, there's a question here from Micronite asking, is Cornwall intended for specific orbit orientations? And uh, I believe it can, I, I believe the inclinations are just basically limited on where you can put Cosmic Girl essentially which yeah. is the which so, is 747 that carries launcher one yeah so cosmic girl can, is a plane can fly anywhere so they send out cosmic girl over the atlantic uh it's the idea for the cornwall based launches and nuki airport is right on the atlantic so it just bringing cosmic girl as close to the coast as possible saves fuel saves time and just makes everything easier because if you think uh, flying out of Mojave, if you don't know, the Mojave Air and Spaceport isn't that close to the coast in California. It's nope. in California, which is a coast state, but it's all California is also very big and it's not close to the coast. <laughs> That's a bit of a tongue twister. So Cosmic Girl has to fly further into the Pacific to get those launches done. But New Key, because it's like right on the sea, it's New Key. It's a key. So, you know, <laughs> that's what it was named after. Yeah, it's a. It, the proximity to the ocean just speeds up the whole flight there and flight back for the carrier aircraft. Yeah, and actually, there's times where if you if you have a long enough lens and you know where to look, you could take photos of Cosmic Girl from LA uh, when the 747 is leaving Mojave to head out to the racetrack that they do um, out there. <laughs> sorry, so, sorry, Rolf Santos oh, yes. just put a comment. So no London City Airport. It's Very actually nice. not Rolf Santos. Very I don't nice, think well. Cosmic Girl would fit. <laughs> yeah, that's a little. Uh, that's a little bit. Uh, Head Crab had asked maybe they could launch from Australia, and I believe the idea with doing it from a 747 is that you can launch from anywhere as long as there's a runway yep. long enough uh, and a place a where the yep. ground support equipment can support it. That's the requirements for Virgin Orbit. I mean, obviously, there's also 
all of the red tape you need to get through but once you get through that once for for each particular country the process is then supposed to speed up as you go along we'll see how that works out with the civil aviation authority here in the uk for their next uk launch but things like getting a spaceport license for spaceport cornwall and then getting an operator license for virgin orbit they've already got their licenses so that should i think be sorted for future launches uh i really like this one from loopy saying they should fly cosmic girl out of uh raf luton <laughs> at some point um and you know what they could probably get it to film by a, a canberra uh you know flying around uh with a, f a video taken from a canberra with that there if you know you know uh but if you don't you should find out go go google raf luton it's it's great um also uh as is being talked about here in our chat room ryan how many times did you get interviewed by the news because you're famous now. um yeah i know I'm, I'm proper famous i am i was on itv national news for five seconds <laughs> uh which which means i'm a mainstream celebrity now yeah clearly. um and I, I was right at the end of the program when everyone tunes out so you know five seconds at the end of the program world famous uh so i was interviewed three times uh, twice before the launch and once afterwards the next day um, by uh, BBC Radio Norfolk, which is the local radio station here in Norfolk, uh, BBC Look East, which is the regional TV channel here, and uh, ITV National Evening News, uh, nice. which went out that same evening. Very nice. Uh, Marty the Martian is saying Luton. Uh, if that's not how to pronounce it, uh, please correct me. I'm always happy. <laughs> well, because we're British, right, and we don't pronounce our T's, it's Luton. Oh, so it's Luton. Luton. So that's how you would pronounce it. Yeah, Luton. As opposed to Luton. American English. Okay, so Luton. Okay. Yeah, thank you all. Now I have uh, now that I've had several years of a word being spoken incorrectly corrected. Um, <laughs> with it there. It's 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 uh it's tomorrow learning Chinese in 2018 all over again. Um, so Luton. Right? Luton? Luton. Luton. Luton, okay. Luton, however you want to pronounce your T's. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> uh, with, and then there were... Uh, I just kind of want to ask overall, Ryan, what was the experience like for you covering this? Like, was this something that you were... Like, did everything that you expected happen? Or was there... Were, were the things that you loved? Were the things that you hated? Like, uh, you know, I've got the experience of covering a multitude of launches from Vandenberg. Um... So what was your experience down in Nuki there? It was cold, but if we if we if we if we ignore the weather, right? Let's ignore the weather because that can't be controlled. Oh my the actual experience of being there with like 2000 members of the public cheering at everything, that was very cool. Um and also the feeling of disappointment was a lot more amplified actually being there when we heard that they had an anomaly. That was a bit strange because I've never experienced that before and that, it hit a lot harder being there with everyone that had worked on it. Um, so yeah, the emotional aspects, the emotions felt were a lot more amplified actually being there. Um, having my stream die twice on me, that wasn't that fun, <laughs> but I got over that. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, and I got to say, uh, oh, yeah, Nick Trier is saying that uh, we need to get you some uh, gloves which can operate touchscreens for next time, some capacitive gloves. Uh, yeah, definitely nice an there. investment that I need to make there. Yeah, and then JTTV was asking how big was the crowd, but she said about 2,000 people there to watch it, which yeah. is really, really there cool. There were, I think, uh, about two two 2,500 tickets, and, um, yeah, I think uh, an estimated 2,000-plus people turned up. So, wow, yeah, that's pretty good. Around that number. Um, and uh, Colton is asking, what future launches are you going to cover? Are you going to try to cover as much as you can in the UK? As much as physically possible, really. I'm, I want to do as many out of Cornwall as possible. Uh, I also, as the vertical launches start up in Scotland and on the Shetland Islands, I, I want to I go up there as well. It's just a logistical nightmare getting up there really is how to put it because i can fly from norwich up to aberdeen and then from aberdeen to the shetland islands but that flight happens 
not very regularly <laughs> so there's a chance that i get up there then they scrub the next day and then i'm stuck there for a week for the next flight which <laughs> wouldn't be the best of <laughs> wouldn't be the best of things yeah very very nice and terence is making a very good point here in our chat room which is two thousand people is like half the country <laughs> um so and i do actually want to ask you because you know this was being uh raised up and 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 shouted from every mountaintop about being the first orbital launch from you know, from England itself um, or the UK, whichever, whichever you prefer, I guess, to use. Um, again, uh, uh, as I show off being an American, uh, very American tonight. So what was it? What was the overall attitude with it like? Um, is it is it something that like people were talking about a lot, or was it just sort of like a blip on the radar overall? Like how how did the country react to it? Um, well, uh, the region. So the the BBC Spotlight were there, who were the regional broadcaster for uh, uh, Cornwall and that kind of area. Um, their entire program was dedicated to it at the the um half past six bulletin and the half past ten bulletin like they were live from there the whole time which was very exciting to see this is obviously a very big moment for that region so that was awesome to see um it in the national news it was just a segment i know i don't know where it was on the bbc news i know on itv news it was at the end because that's where i was and i was opening up their segment on the launch um and i think that was about it really there wasn't it's not like when you go out in public, everyone's talking about it, mm -hmm. but it had enough publicity that a lot of people knew about it, uh, but it, it wasn't like groundbreaking, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I feel like that was kind of the reaction to Falcon Heavy here in the United States for its test flight. Like it was a big deal and it was covered yeah. very uh, yeah. high up in news and stuff like that but also was mm -hmm. one of those things where it wasn't like it wasn't the talk of the town the next day um yeah. you know when i left work and went to starbucks after that to grab my drink you know the barista asked me about what it was all about you know um because i still had all of my work stuff on so did very space oriented you know um so i got asked there but like overall yeah it wasn't with it uh with it and actually nick trier is saying that perhaps ryan can moonlight as a nasa space flight stinger and cover the cornish launches uh, for them as well uh and i like our veil here which is saying sounds like it's time to get ryan a news yacht and <laughs> uh in Indoors. Shetland, in Shetland, are you sure? Yeah, we can go fund. We could get a GoFundMe for a yacht, right? It's gonna be freezing. Yeah, <laughs> I need an icebreaker. <laughs> yeah, and uh, as as uh, Zap Fan Zap Fan is pointing out here, is I liked when the telemetry said that the rocket was going over four billion miles an hour. Which warp factor is that? I'm not sure, actually. So that's a that's a really good question. That's because Cosmic Gold engaged the afterburners for the deployment of yeah of Launcher One. Yeah, that's, that's how... what they should do. Virgin Orbit shouldn't have borrowed a, a Boeing 747. They should have just unretired a Concorde and put it underneath a Concorde and just you know oh. gone over the Atlantic, gone gone Mach two, and then just sorted. A nightmare that would be. Let me tell you. Yeah, but. But imagine that, seeing Concord take a rocket. That'd yeah. be awesome. Uh, absolute nightmare, uh, but also, like, perfect with it. So Jason is, Jason's is got it, so nothing would go wrong. Absolutely nothing would go wrong <laughs> if we did it with a Concord. So, um, yeah. So, so, yeah, so it sounds like overall it was a good experience, except for the fact that the rocket didn't work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, everything we could see works perfectly. So, if we just ignore the rocket failing, it was a wonderful mission. And in all seriousness, Virgin Orbit have proved that they can launch a rocket from the other side of the world, from a new spaceport that was literally just a normal airport apron before they arrived with a, a specialized hangar for satellite and payload integration. So, that's still very successful that entire process from arriving setting up and actually launching the rocket it was just a technical fault on the rocket that um i think it's probably safe to say no matter if they launch this from mojave or new key this fault was probably going to happen anyway yeah um and uh it really it's awesome to kind of see that 
uh, that actually happened. I know we've had, uh, for those of you who uh, are in the know, we've had William Pomerantz, uh, who's the VP. I don't, know, I don't recall if he's still the VP of special projects at Virgin Orbit now or not. Um, but he... Uh, he's a he's, something at Virgin Orbit, at he's least. something in employee number one, uh, if, if I recall correctly, at Virgin Orbit. Um, it, We've had him on the show multiple times, and the last time he was on was back in 2019. And the, and one of the things that me and him talked about during that interview was the importance of having the ability to go to your payload and launch. Um, which that, I, I, I mean, there's a lot of things that are considered game-changing that really don't end up being game-changing, but to me... The ability to say, oh, there's a payload uh, that wants to fly out from the UK and there's multiple ones actually from this area. So if you all just split the cost, we'll bring we'll bring the vehicle to you and launch from there. Um, so that way the integration costs and transport and other stuff is significantly cheaper, um, which can open up that access a lot easier. And then also from what I understand, Virgin Orbit is not looking at just having Cosmic Girl. They're looking at having you know, multiple 747s yeah. at some point um, with mm -hmm. that. But uh, yeah, and um, as JTTV is pointing out, that Astra is the only other one uh, that will quickly, that could quickly launch from a new location, and that also didn't go well. Um, but I mean, it's a little bit different, I feel like, uh, with this, which yeah. is that, you know, with the, with, Virgin Orbit, they're bringing everything to you. Um, Astra's just really fast at essentially set up at already established pads. Um, your yeah. launch pad comes to you with Virgin Orbit, and that's a mm -hmm. very that's a big distinction. It flies to you, literally flies to you. Yeah, that's a very big distinction, um, and that is uh, incredibly incredibly powerful in where you can go and what you can do so somebody earlier was asking can you bring it to australia sure i bet you can um there's ocean around australia you're good to go right so you could take it uh to japan you know launch from there take it to india um take it to saudi arabia take it to south africa you know ev anywhere and everywhere you can think of um as long as there is a runway long enough and there is some sort of uh ability to support the ground support equipment and also i would imagine you know how to handle regulatory stuff and other things yeah. uh, like that <laughs> in those areas so some of those countries i mentioned probably not ready um but i mean hey it's something <laughs> robert <I love. laughs> what about antarctica um i so. mean there's nothing there so i mean theoretically if you want to go any i mean and if you launch from the pole there's only really one kind of orbit which you can achieve which is a polar, polar orbit, orbit. Uh, yeah I mean, i've never yeah. even thought about that before like what if yeah. i do want to build <laughs> my secret lair at the south pole and i'm gonna have to have uh, my launch site there you know how's that how's yeah. that gonna work out um with it and actually uh i'm trying to grab this one real quick from philip whitehouse in our chat um which says you, you can't just use any airport at a moment's notice and that's really i mean yeah true um that's, that's true that is a very valid but i feel point like to make an airport that could support 747 is much more common infrastructure mm -hmm. to be able to build off of quickly with the rocket GSC than a launch pad. There are only so there's probably a dozen launch sites in the world that could support uh, a quick setup. If you if we're thinking oh, all of the Americas, all of Asia. Yeah, the only ones I can airports think of. are littered throughout the world. However, so you just yeah. The only ones I can think of for a rapid deployment would be Rocket Lab and SpaceX at the moment. So that's that's who I could think of off the top of my head. And then even space, and then even both of those, it would be difficult um, in order to do something like that. I know the National Reconnaissance Office did two uh, two fast launches, if you will, with Rocket Lab, but even that it was still scheduled a ahead of time um, with that there. So yeah, um, with that. So yeah, so. Wowee. So, uh, Alexis uh, asking a pretty interesting question here, which is, if, can Virgin Orbit be fitted to a 787 or an A350? Um, no. No. Oh, so, the speciality with Cosmic Girl is... I'm just trying to bring up some photos here. Hang on. The speciality with Cosmic Girl is that she is a 747, and if you didn't know, 747s were built with an uh, a extra 
fifth engine pylon to carry a spare fifth engine with it if it needed to go and service another aircraft so imagine just like you are carrying the tire a spare tire in the back of your car that's essentially what Cosmic Girl and all other 747s are able to do. However, it wouldn't obviously be for that aircraft. It would be for a stranded aircraft somewhere else in the world. So this fifth pylon in the wing, on the left wing, requires a strengthened portion of the wing, which has enabled Virgin Orbit to develop that fifth pylon into the rocket holder and release system, the release mechanism, uh, that is required for Launcher 1. And Launcher 1, it might look small. Launcher 1 is not small. It is absolutely huge when you stand next to it. Obviously not the size of something like the Falcon 9 or SLS. But if you look at it on a screen, you see, oh, it's just little. It's sitting under the plane. It's not little. It's the length of two buses. It's huge. Yeah. Um, rockets are not small. So... No. <laughs> I mean, even the smallest rockets are still relatively big machines um, with it. And I did just want to uh, pull this up as well. I found a really great image of a Qantas 747 with a fifth engine just transporting it um, somewhere. So, yeah, very, very cool yep. uh, with it. So, yeah. And there's another, there's another point that Terence brought up, and there's an image that I found, which I just put in the tomorrow chat if you want to quickly okay, pull yeah. that up. I'm going to grab that if it, if it uh, will. Um, I don't know. We're we're about to find out. Is everybody? No, oh. If you if you click on it, yeah. No, I'm I'm, then, doing, I'm doing it now. There we go. I'm it. Yep. <laughs> Give me a moment. <laughs> it's, it, today is a day. <laughs> so Terence has asked, "What would they call the new cosmic girl, cosmic boy?" Uh, and I'm actually going to answer to that funny comment with a serious answer. Uh, as you can see, today, uh, I don't know if you want to zoom into the nose there. This is Enhanced. Cosmic Girl. Enhanced. Enhanced. It won't let me. Oh, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Can you like right click and open in a new tab or something? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we can uh, we can make it happen. Here we go. With it. Okay, okay. I'm gonna see. So Cosmic Girl, which is currently registered under November seven four four Victor Golf. Oh, will it not yet let you? No, it won't. Oh. Okay, well, you'll just have to squint, ladies and gents. Cosmic Girl is currently registered under November 744 Victor Golf for November, which is what all US aircraft are registered under. 744, which is the code for Boeing 747-400. And then Victor Golf for Virgin Galactic, which was what Cosmic Girl was originally transferred to, because Galactic was originally going to be tourism and what Virgin Orbit does, but then the companies were separated, yeah, yeah, yeah. Before that, when Cosmic Girl served Virgin Atlantic, she was under Gold Victor Whiskey Os Oscar Whiskey. And if you can see right on the nose, Cosmic Girl was called Cosmic Girl when she was flying for Virgin Atlantic, which I think, this is my theory, that is the reason why this specific 747 was brought across, because she was already named with a spacey kind of name. <laughs> they brought her across to Virgin Galactic. So that's my theory. It, oh. is, uh, it has no backing whatsoever, but I think it makes sense. <laughs> that would be awesome. Um, that that's a that's a very strong hypothesis um, with that. So, uh, Headcrab is asking a really interesting question, which I don't know if you want to tackle it or I could tackle it um, with it. Which is, uh, would it be possible to launch two rockets on one flight? Um, unless they can attach the next rocket really quickly as it as it goes over the runway no. at like 150 knots, no, <laughs> no, yeah, uh, no. Um, and John, uh, oh John, I'm gonna mess up your name. I'm so sorry about this, John. What Kwiatkowski? I'm so sorry, John. Um, why not just use an L1011, you know, Lockheed's uh, trijet? that they had back in the day why should why i mean that's what uh pegasus flies on right yeah pegasus so. xl flies underneath an l1011 yes. tristar uh but virgin orbit's whole deal is that it took a 747 from virgin atlantic because that was cheap they didn't have to buy it off anyone they just had to transfer it between companies so yeah, yeah. and well, yeah I also think that the, uh, if I remember right, it's called Stargazer. Um, I believe that... L that sounds right. I believe that L-1011 is actually the only flying L-1011 uh, today. I think so. So, yeah. you and, and if somebody knows, um, 
<laughs> you can you can uh, help me try to figure it out again, John. I'm so sorry, John. <laughs> Although I know you're uh, you're you're uh, probably you're just joking around with us. It's okay. Uh, Larry Demarch with a cool fact here. Scott Manley says uh, he flew on Cosmic Girl when it was with uh, uh, Virgin Atlantic. So that's that's really cool. That's the cool thing. It did serve for Virgin Atlantic. So if you flew on a Virgin Atlantic 747 at some point during Cosmic Girl's career on the airline, there's a chance you could have flown on the plane that launches rockets, which is awesome. I've flown on many Virgin 747s when I was younger, too young to remember what the names of the aircraft were, but there's a chance that I could have flown on Cosmic Girl, which is really cool. Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty awesome. So, um, yeah. I've, I'm, I wish I could say the same thing, but no, I've never, uh, I've never left the USA, so very sorry uh, about that. Um, so, uh, JTTV is saying, uh, aren't all the working space planes based out of the same airport? And um, uh, I'm well, assuming where's the L1011 based. Uh, well, the N- L1011 is based. Uh, oh gosh, I don't know. Actually, that's a really good question. Because Cosmic Girl is based at Mojave, yeah. and uh, Strato Launches Rock is based at Mojave. Um, I'm looking. I'm looking. I'm looking. <laughs> so I got it on the. Uh, uh, Weepy uh, says that uh, I think most of them might be at Mojave, and Jason also follows that. Uh, Philip says Pegasus. Where's Pegasus? Yeah, I would say uh, I would say that's yeah. Oh yeah, Pegasus, Pegasus, Pegasus. That's a that's that is a deep joke, um, Philip. Uh, with that, um, so uh, where's Pegasus? Well, it's a uh, it's a Northrop Grumman. Uh, uh, you know, launcher, uh, but it's not really uh, flying much. I guess is how I would say it. I believe it still has a few more um, left in its in its uh, career, but it's it's. I don't want to say sunsetting, but it's it's definitely not got much left. I'm I'm looking it up real quick <laughs> just to see where it's at. Uh, launch, uh, planned launches. Oh, nothing, apparently. All right, well, <laughs> there you go. Um, uh, oh, Loopy is saying that uh, Stargazer is operated out of Vandenberg, but potentially not based there. Uh, so there is that. Uh, Arvale is asking, is White Knight 2 based out of Spaceport America? And yes, it is in New Mexico. Uh, so that's <laughs> where that's at. Uh, and then... Uh, uh, Cosmic Girls based out at Mojave, so you have that, and then Rock at Mojave as well. Um, although I don't know if Rock is ever going to launch anything to space, we'll have to see. That's that's Star Star future depending. Uh, yeah. With that, but yeah. So there you go. Um, yeah, and Jason is bringing up a really good point here. Uh, someone earlier was saying that that Boeing doesn't build uh any new 747s so it's just so replacement parts are going to be harder to find Uh, but jason brings up also a good point here too which is that boeing is going to support the 747 for at least the next 20 years because oh there are a lot of companies that still rely on using 747s um mostly cargo uh but there's there's some occasional ones that carry people uh, yeah as well i think the only off the top of my head i know lufthansa and korean air operate the the brand new i say brat brand new Boeing 748i passenger variant <laughs> but the 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 last 747-8 freighter to roll off the production line was only like a couple months ago i think so if you're just going to immediately cut all kind of maintenance on that aircraft then what's the point of buying a brand new aircraft it, it doesn't make sense so yeah it, it, the 747 is going to be supported and it is still going to be around for a very long time yeah and uh, um, that's that's oops. the wrong button <laughs> my hand literally slapped it into that right there um just to show you how things are going today but there was we also uh can talk about another company as well with abl space systems and their rs1 rocket um which we do not have the any... another rocket which could launch out of the uk maybe yeah and we don't have any footage of the flight or anything like that this is just uh, B-roll from ABL themselves, and uh, we definitely appreciate that they've got 
that out there. Um, Kodiak is beautiful up there. Uh, absolutely gorgeous. Um, but yeah, uh, didn't work. Unfortunately, fell back down on the pad, damaged the pad. Uh, but also welcome, welcome to air, uh, welcome to rocketry. Sometimes it doesn't work and, uh, fall back down, go boom. And, uh, that's what it did. So, uh, and I think I saw one photo on Twitter, maybe, um, that, that showed it, uh, showed a poof, uh, from post landing, uh, with it. So yeah. landing. Yeah, it was uh, a hard landing, some, a little bit of litho mm-hmm. breaking, um, with it there. Uh, and I'm just pulling up some more of the glamour shots uh, that have been taken of of RS1 because it is it is a it actually is a pretty rocket I want to say in a very yeah. simple kind of way. It's got the kind of classic Mercury uh, like black and white checker patterns for measuring roll and stuff, which is it's kind of it's kind of retro. Yeah, it's pretty amazing uh, with it there, and I guess that's. I guess that's ABL if you want to look inside. Ooh, look at that. We're having a lot of fun, everybody. My finger points. <laughs> nice. Yeah, that looks like a lot of fun with all the work that they're doing there. So, uh, but best, obviously, best of luck to them, you know, on your second flight, whenever that's going to be, and, you know, repairing the pad and other things like that. So, yeah. So, it's really tough. If space was easy, got, everybody would uh, be doing it. I just got an it. image pinged at me. Oh, for okay. This work. Sure. Oh, doesn't work. Maybe no. if I try and copy this one, it will embed. Oh, I got a view of it. <laughs> oh, that's the image. That's the image. Yeah, there it is. So uh, a great, great <laughs> shot of RS1 climbing away from the launch pad. Hey, you know what? It got off of the pad and it flew. That's so an achievement. So there's data involved in that there. So and it... And it didn't power slide, as Bennett says. Yes, that's very, very true. No power slides um, involved in it there. So, I mean, it happens. So, Although, uh, as Bennett is noting, the Astra power slide was excellent. Um, <laughs> as Jason is saying here, that's the Kodiak drift. Uh, <laughs> fast and furious Kodiak drift. So, very, very nice uh, with that there. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, and Robert, there you go. Lots of data that you would have gotten with it. So, um, <laughs> uh, Dan, I like that. A ground induced rud. It's <laughs> a pretty good one. Um, and also, JTTV is bringing up a really good point, um, which is I think they made the right move not to stream. There's enough pressure on a first launch already. Um, and honestly, I think, I think it, the infrastructure is probably not there up at Kodiak. Um, Kodiak is very, very remote, and I mm-hmm. I would agree with that kind yeah. of assessment. It's just every everyone in their dog now live streams their launches, right? Whether it be by them themselves or by independent organizations. So, yeah, it just it's a shame not to see a, a stream from there. But yeah, it's just it may be location or the first launch or whatever but i do hope that we get some video at least if not i'll be very very disappointed i mean obviously they don't want the mass media being go oh abl big failure big boom right that's not what they want that would be bad publicity but as a space fan i want i want to see the rocket however it ends up yeah i feel like there's something to be said about uh embracing your failure um and you know, tr- I guess trying to remind everybody that failure is something that happens on the road uh, to success. Obviously, you don't want to have too much of that, um, but I mean, it happens. Nobody's perfect, so um, you know, SpaceX has blown up two payloads. <laughs> um, Rocket Labs lost payloads. Uh, I mean, it just happens to everybody at some point. Uh, Dada, t- some very wise advice. Dada is good. Dada is wise. Um, some something that uh, Dada once told me is that you're only good until you're not. So, and that's some that's yeah. some quality. That's a quality Dadaism right there. Um, and also, I'm just going to bring this up since it's uh, coming here real quick. So there you go. There's the launch, and then the rocket goes. Whee! Yay! Yeah, I'm sure it made that noise. And that exact noise. 
So. And oh, it's done. <laughs> and nothing. So yeah, no, uh, no view of the red from that. Maybe they will. Maybe they won't. Uh, it's their call. So. I was gonna uh, yeah, it is up to them. It'd be nice to see, but I, it depends if they're willing to have potential poor publicity. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's always a risk, right? So that's that's the thing. So, uh, and are you willing to take that risk? I guess is uh, is how to say it. So, um, oh my gosh, we have oh, oh, oh our avail bringing up the classic. Yep. Cue the sea <laughs> launch logo. So. Yeah, that's uh, that's kind of how it goes. Um, oh, where's it at? Uh, Loopy was asking, so between Vega, Virgin, and ABL, do you think there's going to be any ramifications on stuff like the space flight industry, uh, space flight insurance industry, and on uh, these other startups trying to get investors as well? Um, I don't know, Ryan. Um, let me put I, you on the spot I, here. What do you think? <laughs> I don't think so. Um, Vega... Uh, and Launcher One and ABL, they're all unrelated incidents. They're not. They're not like a, They're not the same family of launch vehicles. They're not the same operator. They're not the same location. They're different launch vehicles, and each launch vehicle has to be treated and judged independently. I will say in Vega's case, it has seen many failures over the last few launches in the standard original version and the new Vega C version launcher one this is two failures out of six total flights it's their first failure with a commercial payload on board so they still the majority of their flights have been successful and with abl this is their first flight the first flight if you expect the first flight to succeed you are not looking at these things in the right way the first <laughs> flight is not going to succeed general rule first flight is not going to exceed if it does succeed that's incredible like with sls and artemis one that was a flawless mission and that was the first that was the maiden flight of that vehicle which is incredible yeah. to see and that was completely unexpected that is not what we were expecting at all yeah. so if you're expecting the first flight of a brand new company's brand new vehicle no, it's not. It's not going to happen. Yeah, uh, yeah. And Falcon Heavy is another one that worked on its first flight. Which I mean, that yep. was. Um, I I didn't even. I thought it was probably going to make it a minute or something like that um, with it. Um, but Grubbly is asking: Are all launches insured? I assume there's liability, but I bet many payloads are uninsured. Um, and there are absolutely missions that are not insured, such as science missions. You know, no nobody's going to cover the cost of a two and a half billion dollar Mars rover if your if your uh, Atlas ruds on the way up. You know, that's not going to happen. Um, so that doesn't so. Science missions are typically uninsured, uh, simply because nobody's going to cover that. Um, <laughs> you know, that's you know, you roll the dice every time you do that, yep. both in terms of launch and also the rest of the mission too, right? Um, so that's yep. the way it goes. Yeah, <laughs> I like this one from JTTV, which is that the U.S. government <laughs> is self-insured. <laughs> so yeah, so um, also. Um, uh, yeah, Philip Whitehouse also bringing uh, also bringing it up. Uh, I'll bring that one back up, Bennett, because that was funny. Not the one I wanted to do um, yet, but um, Philip Whitehouse saying all government missions are uninsured. It's just commercial sats to get the insurance. And then Bennett, where I, uh, the chat room skipped on me there. Mars EDL isn't covered by Geico Collision. So, <laughs> yeah, entry, descent, landing, smash into the ground, not covered under Geico. So, yeah. Um, yeah, Schiaparelli may may have a word or two about that uh, to tell us all with that. So, yeah. And then also, I would imagine your first mission on your rocket, you're probably not going to put a important payload on it either. Like, you're going to no. put something that you're willing to lose, I guess. Yeah, um, and then like there, a wheel of cheese or a, a, <laughs> or, Tesla, or your a car. cherry red Tesla Roadster, yeah. <laughs> I've got plenty. Don't need it. Yeah. It's fine. Or, Put it or, on a rocket. Or like Rocket Lab, where they la launched Humanity Star. Uh, that that sort of art. Yeah. That piece of art, I guess, is how I would Fancy disco it. ball. Orbital yeah. disco ball. <laughs> yeah, with it there. Um, so, yeah. 
so typically that's typically you don't really have anything on your first flight to worry about either um so yeah we'll see about second flights uh here or the i mean virgin orbit is uh is enough i think they're established enough that they're they're gonna have a payload on the next flight so yeah um oh dan i like that one uh insurance is void when your airbags go off on mars landing <laughs> nice arvale as well um astronomers hate this one simple trick so very good uh with that there appreciate it uh with it so <laughs> Ryan, you got anything? Anything else? That was pretty much it, really. That's what that's what's been occupying my well, I'd say my week, but it's been occupying my brain for the last four months since they arrived, basically. So, <laughs> yeah, I think it's probably time we talk about some. Now this is out of the way. Let's move on. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, we had the update on Soyuz MS twenty two and what's going to occur um, involving that. So, um, so that's a, a it really isn't a very cheerful show, is it? It's just one failure after failure after leaky oxygen. I have a little stuff. I have a little cherry to put on the ashes for the end of the show, okay. but I'm not I'm not okay. there yet. So, but I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna it's it's a little bit related to the astronomers hate this one trick, um, you know thing. We'll 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 that will circle back. Um, but no, I mean, uh, you know, so as MS 22, I guess we now officially know that it was a coolant leak. Um, so, and what a mess it made. Right. So, um, I know whenever I'm leaking coolant, I, I end up having that happen uh, and I just blow it all into orbit. So it's usually not good. Um, but we now know and so as MS-23 is going to be launched uncrewed uh, because you actually can fly a Soyuz without a crew, you know, automated docking system and all that. Uh, and that'll be coming up. And if I recall correctly, they are putting the two cosmonauts on board. Um, and then Frank Rubio, the astronaut on board of the space station right now, will not be coming back on that Soyuz. Um if I recall correctly, so if I'm wrong, someone in the in the chat room uh, will absolutely. I thought they were going to put all three on MS-23, but in a back in an emergency situation, two the cosmonauts would go on MS-22, which would be a bit all right, and then Rubio would go on Crew Five in a some sort of improvised emergency taped to the wall chair hammock solution, which probably wouldn't be the most comfortable, but you know. Yeah, um, yeah, not the best way to do it. I don't know if I would return in a hammock. Uh, that didn't that didn't sound like a good idea. Um, yeah, actually, uh, I'm trying to grab it from Loopy here. Oh, the chat room moves so fast sometimes. Uh, but yeah, they've taken Rubio's seat out of the Soyuz and strapped it in with the cargo tie down points in Dragon for the time it being. So if they have to. Uh, and as uh, the launch pad is uh, pointing out here, uh, it's either the hammock in, in Crew Dragon um, or a 40 degree Celsius re-entry. So, uh, it's not just re-entry either, it's undocking from the ISS, it's going down to the atmosphere, it's re-entering the atmosphere, it's then sitting in that capsule until you're recovered in 40 degrees, 100% humidity, in yeah. a spacesuit, yeah. in a thick spacesuit. Yeah. I mean, come on! Do they have Are you... Do the do the uh, the uh, in the Soyuz with their Sokol suits? Do they have cooling in them, like some sort of? I'd imagine they. System? I, I imagine so. they use. I'd imagine they use coolant, uh, like plugged into the spacecraft. Right. But as we've seen, there's no there's no coolant left. So. <sighs> yeah. So as with it, as Loopy is bringing up here, actually a really good point, um, which is we need to talk about the time that Norm Thaggard was brought down from Mir by shuttle with a glorified folding beach chair sometime. And that actually is true. <laughs> I mean, if they did it on shuttle, they can do it on dragon. Yeah. Yeah. Why not? So sounds, sounds good to me uh, with it. So yeah, there you go. So. It actually happened. So we joke about it, but it actually happened. And real. as Eka here is saying, you know, a ah, strong enough hammock will be fine. So, um, you know, 
that's that's uh yeah. with it oh, oh my gosh robert i love this one which is that i still can't believe the plan the shuttle doors didn't close so <laughs> that's an interesting contingency um have you ever heard of that one ryan um probably but i've forgotten yeah so they they would actually pull them closed they would send an astronaut into the payload bay to get them closed and then the yeah. astronaut would have to ride out the flight in the payload bay because the space lab <laughs> or whatever <laughs> things that are in the payload bay would be in the way and the astronaut would not be able to get back to the airlock so they would most likely have to ride out re-entry in the payload bay <laughs> oh my god <laughs> which is wild that sounds, um, that sounds really unfun but also, I feel I feel like Musgrave would have just loved that. Oh, but for Story any would have done other it. astronaut, any other astronaut, <laughs> I, I could have imagined mission, it. He he got up and walked around with a I video know. camera on reentry. So. <laughs> but that wasn't that wasn't in the payload bay. That was in the cockpit. <sighs> yeah, but I mean, but I mean, nobody else did that. <laughs> Could you imagine, like, you're on re-entry and you're, like, working, you know, and you're looking at everything and then all of a sudden somebody's, like, looking over <laughs> your shoulder <laughs> and, like, putting a camera in front of you. Can you imagine coming just in a normal aircraft, just coming into land and then the person in front of you just gets up and goes to the loo and you're, like, two miles from the runway? Eka's got a great point Get alone in a spacecraft. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... Good, good stuff. Um, man, that's that's something else I got to say. Um, uh, uh, oh yeah, Jason. There's also a, a part of that contingency where the astronaut is holding the door closed the entire time um, with that that uh, tension, those lines, the tension lines in there with it. If you want to, uh, Wayne Hale, uh, shuttle uh, shuttle man extraordinaire. Um, maybe one of my favorite engineers of all time. Um, he has a fantastic blog where he will write stories every once in a while about what it was like to work on shuttles, some of the things they had to deal with and other things like that. Um, and he, that's where I learned about that contingency because he wrote about it and he wrote about the fact that they planned the contingency and then they realized, Oh, right. There's a whole bunch of stuff in the payload bay that the astronauts not going to be able to get around. Whoops. So, <laughs> um, and our veil here is saying, oh, we need to get Wayne Hale on the show. And oh my gosh, I would, I would be doing backflips and probably, uh, <laughs> unable to talk starstruck, um, in that sort of, that sort of area. So, um, yeah. Also, I don't know what you said here, Ryan, but, uh, head crab is saying that, uh, Ryan should not blame himself for forgetting he was not born yet. So um, that would have been the contingency plan. Yes. But I, I've, I, I think, I think it does ring a bell. I've heard about something as ludicrous as that before. It is legendary in its ludicrousness. Um, that is, yeah, in its, <laughs> in its wildness uh, with it there. So, yeah. Um, so I've got something that I actually really want to talk about. Um, some something I feel like is good um, to happen. So, yeah. um, and that I is, yeah, I was going to say that is Starlink, um, and astronomy, Ooh. Ooh. as you know, look at those pretty organized stars in yeah. perfect lines. I was going to say, this is, this is actual data from a, a actual research telescope. Um, and as you could see, there are streaks of Starlinks through it, which basically means that a, a large majority of this data has been wrecked. Um, unfortunately, um, but there's at least six rectangles that don't have star links in though. Oh yeah. That's definitely going to help me out, you know, with, uh, with the data I've been gathering. Um, yeah, that, that ought to help. <laughs> um, and, uh, I just want to point out something that has, that just happened this past week, uh, which is that the National Science Foundation, which, uh, runs a majority of the telescope. I'm sorry, science. I'm sorry, Bennett, Bennett's coming. What? <laughs> <laughs> That's the new capture. <laughs> Please select all cells containing Starlink. Oh my gosh. Oh, chat room, chat room, chat room. 
chat room. You're if so we good. had the Vesta board behind Jared, that would be the Vesta board comment. I feel like that is the that's the comment of the show right there. That one's pretty good. Yeah, I can see the Vesta board um, over there. But I mean, I can put it to the Vesta board, but you'll hear the Vesta board. You won't see it. You'll hear it. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I could go. I could maybe go turn that camera on. I don't know if you have a button for that camera, though, so... Uh, yeah, I don't know about it either, so... With it, but anyway, so, yeah. Bennett, that is the Vesta board comment. You can't see it, it is there. But we have pushed it <laughs> to our Vesta board, so... Or, sorry, yes. so Jamie's Vesta board. Um, <laughs> is it there, so very, very good. But... One of Jamie's three Vesta boards. <laughs> oh, did she really? She's got one for, um... Here, one for, and then a couple for home, I think. Something oh. like that, I can't remember. Gotcha, okay. Yeah, that's, um... All right. So, uh, yeah, I just, uh, I usually, I talk about Starlink uh, with a not so happy look on my face. Um, but also, I am most certainly someone who understands that no, there's nothing we can really do about it at this point. So we're just going to have to start developing the technology to move Starlink out of our data uh, like this. And, um, and there's just really no sol solutions other than that. Like, I'm not even kidding. There's, it's, it's just, it, ground-based astronomy is not over, um, but now it is significantly more complicated, going to require significantly more computing power in order to do what it is. A lot more limited in what you can see and when. Yes, absolutely, 100%. Um, even in some cases, space telescopes as well. I just want to remind everyone that this right here is an image from Hubble. Um, so, yeah. Uh, even space telescopes can be affected by it. And I, I bring that up because there were a whole bunch of people that just said, oh, well, you know, just throw your telescope in space. Um, no. <laughs> well, that's because Hubble isn't at the Earth L2 point. Yes. The Earth's on L2 point. So, we so what we should do is send... A when Jared Eisenberg goes up to do his Hubble servicing mission with <laughs> Crew Dragon, they should send it out to L2 and then satellites won't get in Hubble's way. Problem solved. <sighs> Good stuff. Um, but I do want to say, credit where credit is due. Um, SpaceX is working with the National Science Foundation to... Uh, it's for Starlink version 2 satellites to be as dark as they possibly can be, as less reflective as they possibly can be. Um, so big ups to SpaceX for doing that. They don't have to do that at all, right? They could just they, they could just be like, ah, screw it, you know, whatever. Uh, just stop Internet bothering for us. All. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's really nice to see that. And it's definitely appreciated. Um, also, uh, uh, Blue Walker three, right? That's the one with the big antenna that unfolded as well. Uh, uh I, I can't remember if it's called Blue Walker. Me neither. Um, well, someone in our, our I've chat heard the room name will, Blue Walker three. Someone in our chat so, room. Yeah. Everybody's Loopy saying, says ah, it sounds, sounds right. It sounds right. So, um, yeah, it's, it's just nice uh, uh that company that that flew that is also talking with the nsf to national science foundation um to work with making their satellites dark as not well NASA space flight. so not nasa space flight yeah the national science foundation so although we love them all uh with that uh so Ryan, that's all I wanted to say, which was, uh, that's all, at least that's all I got to say, which is big up to SpaceX for, for collaborating and um, announcing that they're working with uh, the National Science Foundation. It's, it's definitely uh, greatly appreciated um, with that. So without further ado, <laughs> Robert, Robert has a good comment. <laughs> just go and ask if, the, if just go and ask the, see if the National Reconnaissance Office has any more mirrors they could give to NASA. Yeah. Oh, Loopy. Oh, my gosh. All right. Fine. We'll talk about this stupid comet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. What's the comet done to you? <laughs> Just look. Comets. I don't like talking about comets um, because every two or three years, something will come along where they'll be like, oh, it's the comet of the century. Here it comes. It's going to be so bright. You're not even going to be able to. Uh, understand like it will blow your mind and then it just fizzles um because comets of the century there are 
very are abs- absurdly rare um with that um but it's comment i don't even know the name of the comment i frankly don't care about the name of the comment um <laughs> This is going to make a great YouTube show. Yes, exactly. Um, and uh, the comment, uh, comment whatever, um, I've seen predictions um, that it's going to get at its brightest magnitude 5, which if any of you would like to know what you need to do in order to see it, if you want to see it with your naked eye, you're going to have to go to some of the darkest skies in the world to be able to pull that off. Um because unlike stars or planets where they are relative points of light and we could say, oh, you know, uh, Venus gets up to magnitude negative four. Um, so we're looking at the point, if you will, um, from your eyes perspective of, of its brightness. A comet's brightness is spread over its entire size. It's not just it's like, you know, that's, and those are the technical terms from it. Or, um, and yeah, it's going to be, uh, very difficult to see. Uh, you, if you have some good binoculars or a, a telescope, I would say probably four inches or larger. Um, and you go to dark sky. So this is not something you can sit in your, your living room and look at. You're going to, or for most of us, at least, I don't know, you might live in dark skies. Um, but you got to go to dark skies for it. Uh, and basically, uh, I could care less about it, uh, because it's one of those things where if you hype it up, a whole bunch of people are going to go out, they're going to try to look for the comet, they're not going to see it, and they're going to think astronomy sucks. So, so usually that's why we don't, you know, that's why I, I personally don't hype up these kinds of, of comets when they come through. Yeah, it's cool and all, but it's one of those things where like, you really need to be, know what you're doing um, in order to actually be able to see it. So it's not like Comet Neowise where you could actually get out of the city a little bit and see it with your naked eye. I was able to do that um, back in 2020 um, from uh, Angeles National Forest, which is not far from LA. So it's still light pollution hell, um, but it was still doing it. So, but yeah, um yeah i'm very sorry loopy um yeah it's just it you can go try to see it if you'd like to but it's just going to be really really difficult so um uh, <laughs> yeah um yeah no <laughs> jared can we book me a plane to go see it through your telescopes over there i'm tired of having never seen a comet um no because our telescopes here in la will not be able to see it so uh so there you go so <laughs> <laughs> yeah i know loopy you were talking earlier about being born under hail bop but not being able to see it and uh uh that sucks uh because i was nine when hail bop was happening and it was amazing um and that the best thing about it was that even here in los angeles it was naked eye visible um and you could see the tail in going in a specific direction off of it which was amazing it didn't look like a fuzz you could actually see a tail uh-huh. from it um i remember one night uh getting my little like kitty telescope out with my dad and my dad fell in the rose bush and i was laughing so hard i threw up on the front lawn so um <laughs> yeah so that's my beautiful hail bop story um <laughs> with that there <laughs> and it, all the while my dad is in the rose bush, bush going god you little come and pick me up so um yeah <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's, uh loopy is saying that's a very good comet memory yeah it, it's probably one of my all-time favorite memories of both astronomy and my father uh, so to wrap up this show of course we want to thank all of you who helped make this show possible um now that i have persuaded you all not to go look at the comet um we want to start <laughs> off uh by thanking <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to start off by thanking, and I have to wait for this to pop up uh, to see yeah. it here, our Tomorrow Model 33 Plaid Pro Plus member, Neurostream. We appreciate you so, so much. Uh, man, it is it is a lot to do that. Um, also, our Escape Velocity members as well. If you are an Escape Velocity member, which, by the way, you could go to YouTube.com com slash tmro slash join hopefully i said that right um and uh you can join you can literally join right now if you want to um with it if you become a i'd also just like to give a shout out to kylie who during the start me up stream decided to upgrade their membership up to escape velocity so thank you very much excellent welcome to escape velocity we'll get you if you join the discord you can get in the escape velocity channel so yeah, Are yeah. You in the Discord? i don't know if you're in the discord or not yeah you might and be in the discord i don't know 
Yeah, and then we've got our orbital members as well. Super, super helpful um, with it. <laughs> and people are starting to spam the chat with our Atlas sticker and our uh, uh, dolphins. So long, and thanks for all the fish. Oh, thank you guys so much. We also have our suborbital members uh, as well. Uh, you know, if you are a member at any level, you get to watch the after show as well, which we're going to be rolling into after we're done thanking our ground support members uh, as well. And we also have our system support members. Um, all it takes is ninety nine cents a month that's it and you get to roll in um with it um and that would be like absolutely great if you would do that so we super appreciate it so don't forget to like subscribe comment uh, uh make the algorithm work for us um that's always the goal um with it so that wraps up uh, our sh first show of 2023, which wasn't as big a disaster uh, as I was thinking it was going to be, Ryan. Um, and also... <laughs> Especially with all these launches not going very well. I was well. just about to say, it also did not go as wrong as all of these launches over the past couple of weeks. So that's the me that's mean. Um, but the end of the show justifies the mean. So uh, thank you all so much uh, for watching tomorrow. And I'll be here next week. What about you, Ryan? Uh, I should be here next week. All right. Sounds like we'll have a show. So bye, everybody. We'll see you later. Take it easy. I'm just waiting for Ryan to hit the bye -bye. stop button. Yeah, I'll now. press the button.